Good evening, everybody. This is What Does the Bible Say? My name is Caleb Robertson. I am an evangelist with the Danville Church of Christ, and we work alongside of the uh, Martinsville Church of Christ, Martinsville, Virginia. This is a two-state live religious broadcast. So if you're watching tonight, this is happening live. We uh, will be in the studio, and our phone lines are going to come up, and I just want to say this now. Last week, we had a phone call come in, and he was local. He was calling from, like, the 276 area code. And sometimes people are calling, and I don't think they know how it works, but just treat it like a normal phone call. Don't try to talk to me through your TV. You just talk to me through your phone, and we'll be able to go back and forth that way. So tonight, let's jump in with Matthew chapter 3. So some of y'all have been watching this broadcast for a while. This is What Does the Bible Say? It's live. It's a religious call-in show. What are we doing? You, if you know us, you know that we're the only religious group in this area that's going against all of the man-made sectarian groups. I'm not Baptist, I'm not Catholic, <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I'm saying like when you see these uh, bumper stickers in town where they say, I support Father Mark White, I've already said the biggest thing that Mark White can do for himself is stop being a Catholic and become a Christian. I'm not gonna be able to back him until he becomes a real New Testament Christian and stop being a Catholic. That is a division from the New Testament church. They split off. Now, here you see what I'm saying? You see what we're doing. You see what we teach. Now, look at this verse here. Can you imagine what it would have actually been like? With I don't know that there was any type of announcement before John starts preaching, but when he comes in, he says to the people, repent. So when you're hearing John and everybody's going out to hear John out in the wilderness and people are saying, so we're going to go see John. Okay, what's he want from us? What do you mean? Well, he's out here teaching. What's he want us to do about it? And I think, I think that's what a lot of people do that watch What Does the Bible Say? What do y'all want us to do about it? I want you to get into your Bible and start asking questions. Stop blindly following the traditions just because it's what your grandparents did. Now, everybody's up in arms all over the country about so many different things that traditionally, they say traditionally, that's not right. We shouldn't be doing it. Hey, if you can speak out against those things and say tradition doesn't matter, why can't you pick up your Bible and say, follow the Bible and traditions don't matter? See, we're trying to call everybody to a point of action. You need to be more investigating. You need to be more inquisitive as to why you do what you do in religion. Now let's look at this. And here's my point, just as we start out. I know you don't have a problem with me because I know that historically you don't have a problem. You appreciate people who stand up for something. Now, whether it's religiously speaking, Martin Luther, just about everybody appreciates Martin Luther for whatever reason. They, they are fine with this man disagreeing with the Catholic sect. They like what Martin Luther did when he took on the Catholics. Now, you leave the religion, and Martin Luther being the religion, uh, religion aspect, and you get into Martin Luther King, Junior, and you say civil rights, he was taking a stand. He was leading a whole group of people to take a stand. And they had to put a lot on the line to make their stand. And you love this. Here's a book. I would recommend it. Both of the copies that I have found came out of Goodwill. JFK wrote a book called Profiles and Courage, and he wrote this when he was a very, very young man. And everybody loves the story of somebody who gets something done. My thing my point of coming into your home tonight by way of TV or the internet is let's get something done in the North Carolina area and in the Virginia area and if we do it here it can spread into other places. Now I will tell you this, what we're doing as far as the two congregations that work together of the Church of Christ, Martinsville and Danville, um, we are getting plenty done. If you tell people about what does the Bible say on YouTube We've got over 2 million views and what is it, over 3,000 subscribers and people are just, and what we're saying is it's something distinct. It's Bible discussion. It's not, listen, I listened to a preacher talk the other day and number one, he, he spent the first 12 minutes telling jokes and that's no joke. He went 12 minutes just joking around with everybody and then he doesn't even like crack open the Bible or give you a scripture reference. He just starts talking about uh, God's grace is this huge overwhelming wave and it's just there's nothing to it we want to help people get back in their book we want to help bring unity to the religious community and what we're saying is you're not going to listen politics isn't going to fix anybody's homes and I'm talking about you can put out all the grants that you want 
all the welfare that you want. You can build rec centers. Politics is not going to fix anything until we fix our inner being with the truth, the Bible. We make ourselves more morally upright, and we train up our children to be that way. Love your neighbor. That's what I mean by morally upright. We're not going to get any better. So let's look at this. Tell your friends about what does the Bible say on YouTube. Now, tonight we're doing, if you want to say part three of, remember last week I came on and I said, would you want people in the future to find, like, in some antique shop on a dusty shelf, they wipe it off and they say, hmm, Billy Graham. And they're going to take a Billy Graham home, uh, book home with them. Would you like that? Well, what I'm doing is I am finding all these books from the 1800s, and these are actually discussions from the 1700s, 1790s. Can I discuss those with you? And do those bear any weight to the discussion? Now, let me talk to you. You can't tell me on your doorstep, I'm out door knocking, and I ask you, why do you do the things that you do religiously speaking? Why are you a Baptist? And you say, Caleb, we have always been Baptist. That's our tradition. So here's what I'm doing tonight. Don't tell me that you care about tradition when I come in with your history books your traditional books, right? And I'm showing you things in there, and I'm saying, traditionally speaking, you're not actually what you think you are. A lot of y'all are saying, well, we're Baptists because we're traditionally Baptists. You ain't nothing like the Baptists that used to be. And if you say we're Methodists because we used uh, our traditions to be Methodists, you're still not like the Methodists that used to be. That's what I'm trying to do tonight. Let's look at these historical documents. Let's study them. Let's put them next to the Bible. And let's, you and me, try to make it a better more unified religious community. Now, we're doing part number three tonight. We talked about James O'Kelly. I said, some of y'all call me a Campbellite, and I'm not. Alexander Campbell, y'all say, Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ. So I asked you the question, what if I could show you a Methodist who was doing what Alexander Campbell did, what, tw at least 20 years, right? Close to 20 years before Alexander Campbell came to America. That was James O'Kelly. And James O'Kelly worked with a man named Rice Haggard. And what did Rice Haggard write his little booklet on? To the different religious societies on the sacred import of the Christian name, what did they want to do? They said, we're tired of being called Methodists. We only want to be Christians. We don't want any type of board, you know, any of that stuff, the denominational superstructure. And they said, we want to follow the Bible only. Now, they did that coming out of Methodism. They did it before Alexander Campbell came to America, so you can't call me a Campbellite. Now, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to continue on with that discussion, but we're doing part number three of it, which means I'm introducing you tonight to five new Presbyterians. And as I say that, let me make another commercial. Don't stop watching now, but I'm saying go later and re-watch this show that I did. What was the date? January 19th of this year, remember we were talking about another Presbyterian preacher named Alexander Carson. He started studying his Bible, he left Presbyterianism behind, and he left infant baptism behind. These folk, when they studied their Bible, they left their traditional religion behind, and they lined up with God's religion. Does that un do you understand what I'm saying here? We come on, let's talk about this, infant baptism. Would you baptize your baby? And you're, some of y'all are sitting at home saying, well, why would we? The Bible never commands us to do anything remotely close to that. Okay, I'm with you. But let's talk about this. You would not baptize your baby because you, said, you would say, the Bible commands us to immerse people in water. Do you get the argument? The Bible doesn't tell you not to sprinkle a baby. The Bible tells you to immerse somebody. So now let's move it to another realm. You all are using a piano in your worship. My brethren in the Church of Christ, we don't use a piano in the worship. And y'all say, well, that's strange. Why don't y'all use a piano? Because the Bible never commands us to do that. Then you come along and say, well, it doesn't tell you not to. But you just said a minute ago that it doesn't matter if the Bible says don't sprinkle. You've got a direct command to immerse. See, all these man-made religious groups, they've got changing that they need to do. And what I'm trying to do with this broadcast is to show you people have been making these changes. They've been seeing these problems long before you and I got here. You can do it too. Now, what can I say? Don't be mad at me because I'm already in the body of Christ, right? 
you're hearing me say there's some changes that need to be made. Y'all tithing where you go? Y'all need to stop tithing. There's no New Testament commands for tithing, taking a 10%. No command for that. There's no command for instrumental music. Y'all are going against authority. You need to change that. Are y'all using women preachers over there? You need to change that too. That's 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. See what I'm saying? But you're going to look at me and say, well, Caleb, what do y'all need to change? If you show me something that I need to change and you show me what the Bible will talk about it, but I'm not using women preachers. We don't command, we don't teach, or take up tithes, 10% necessity offerings from the people, and we don't use instrumental music. We don't baptize our babies. So if you find something, you talk to me about it. But if you recognize there's some changes that y'all need to make where you are, don't be mad at me just because I'm not there with you. But I would love for you to be where we are, which is in the body of Christ. And I don't just mean our brick and mortar, build, mortar building. I'm saying the identity of being a Christian and not a Methodist. The identity of being a Christian, not a Presbyterian. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at this. Tonight I'm going to show you five Presbyterians. And look at this. You know, what's that riddle? I've got however many coins in my hand, one of them's not a dime. Well, one is a dime, but the other one's not a dime. This isn't some trick. Five Presbyterians that abandoned Presbyterianism in the 1800s, and two of them are not. Thomas and Alexander Campbell. Well, this has nothing to do with Campbellism, right? You all say Campbellites, nothing to do with them. I want you to look at a man named Richard McNamara. And here's the thing. Look, you learn from history. Just like anybody else, we had Martin Luther King Jr. on the screen. You learn from that history, bravery, courage, things of that nature, dedication and sacrifice for a cause. You learn all this stuff from studying historical points of reference. I've got your history tonight. History of the Presbyterian Church in the state of Kentucky by Robert Davidson. Reasons for separating from the General Synod of Ulster, Alexander Carson. Now this is one we've talked about before, I'm just showing you. I've got your books and I'm showing you individuals defecting, leaving the denominations behind because they were in search for the real religion of the Bible. Now we say that the real religion of the Bible, is there a church in the Bible? Yes. Were there any divisions of it back then? There were no Baptists back then. There were no Methodists or Catholics or Presbyterians. So why can't we drop all that and go back to the New Testament? Just do it just like they were doing. Are you with me on that? And that's why I want us to look at these five different Presbyterians, see what they were doing, Richard McNamara, and see what they did and say, why don't you do it today the Bible way? Now let's make one more point. <laughs> That sounded funny, didn't it? Bible Way. Bible Way Cathedral, right? Bible Way Cathedral got some changes they need to make. You need to do it the New Testament fashion. Look, now here's one. Here's the five men. Here's the name of the five men that we're going to talk about tonight. And one reason that I did want to do this too, I was out the other day and I was uh, visiting with a man who used to be in the Presbyterian denomination. He's not with them anymore. He associates himself with Baptists now. But because he had Presbyterian background, I actually had, you see these green books, I had one of those copies with me in the car. And so I asked him, I said, you used to be with the Presbyterians. He said, yeah, I was. I said, do you know who Barton Stone is? He said, no, I don't know who that is. And I figured that if he doesn't know, there's probably going to be several other people out here who don't know who that individual is and doesn't know. Now, y'all, we've got two little Presbyterian groups here in Martinsville. We might have three. And they got changes they need to make. I'm not picking on anybody, right? I've got concern and love for everybody, and I love the truth. I love the New Testament, and I'm saying I, I very much respect doing things God's authorized way. So let's look at this. Look at what it says here. In 1803, done in Lexington, Kentucky, September 1803. So that's, uh, that's six years before Alexander Campbell comes to America. And look at what they're saying. Here highlighted, these five men say, nor do we desire to separate from your communion or to exclude you from ours. So these five men are fixing to get into some hot water and they say on the, about the tail end of all the events, they said, we're not trying to make a whole new party. And what are we talking about? Now let's think about this. They don't want to make a new party. You got Catholics over here. And then years later, you've got King Henry VIII who wants a divorce, and the Catholics won't give it to him. So he says, fine, I'll go start my own church, and we'll call it the Church of England. 
You just get party after party. They said, we're not trying to make a new party. We're not trying to make a new sect. They said, we're just trying to follow the Bible. Now, here they are. Robert Marshall, uh, John Dunlavy, Richard McNamara, Barton Stone, and John Thompson. Now, you say, I don't know these dudes from Adam, and that's fine, but we're going to look at what they were doing tonight, and let's talk about it. They were Presbyterians, and several of these people are like full-blown, ordained Presbyterian preachers. Now, let's look at this. I need you to take one second and know that you can contact me at 276-806-3641. My dad is 276-806-2150, and my email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. Why did I have to pause for my material to give you our contact information? I'm doing this live show because I care about you. Now, somebody might be saying, you're doing this live show because it's your job. Man, if we were just talking about doing a job, I could find another job that would not be as taxing. People's souls and their life decisions and their life problems. I was talking with my producer right before we got going about people's life problems that I'm finding out about right before I walk into the studio. I want you to know that we're willing to help you. And we're not trying to get a love offering and a tithe and a donation, anything like that. We're saying you, you are people, you are a soul, and somebody needs to care about you. There are people out here that don't have anybody looking out for them. No, and someone would say, I feel like nobody cares about me. You may not have anybody around you. And we're saying we want to extend ourselves to you. That's the only reason we put that out there. If you have Bible questions, you're local, you'd like to get in touch with us, and you'd like to have a Bible study, feel free to get in touch with us anytime. Now, somebody says to me, the same individual, I was sitting down, he didn't know who Barton Stone was, but he used to be a Presbyterian. He said, Caleb, what is the point of what does the Bible say? What's the purpose of the show? What does the Bible say? And I gave him two things. And before we look at those five Presbyterians, I need you to know this. What does the Bible say has been coming on the air for over 20 years for two reasons? We want you to study your Bible more often. And when you study your Bible, number two, we want you to think for yourself. Don't, you do not have to study the Bible and then call somebody and run it up the flagpole to see how they feel about it. You do not have to study your Bible and then pick up the, whatever denomination you're in, you don't have to pick up their creed book and say, is, is this what we traditionally say? No, you read the Bible and you think for yourself, but here's the thing. The first two are never going to happen, are never going to be possible as long as the sectarian mindsets are here. What are we talking about? You're never, you're going to have to leave your man-made sect. Do you get what we're saying? You made a division, 1 Corinthians 12, 25, you made a schism from the body of Christ. You are never going to be able to think for yourself as long as you have to march to the beat of their drum. If, now, I'm saying this, y'all. If you're Baptist, you are never going to be able to deviate from the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, if you're Southern Baptist, you're not. You're not going to be able to deviate from, against the Baptist faith and message. You're not going to be able to do it. And when the moment that you start, people's antennas are going to shoot up and they're going to eye in on you. Now, if you're Presbyterian, you're never going to be able to deviate from the Westminster Confession of Faith. If you're a Catholic, you've got a whole just boat filled with catechism that you're never going to be able to deviate. And you've got a whole list of oral tradition that you probably don't know half of that you're not going to be able to deviate from. You're a Lutheran, you're going to have multiple books. Luther's uh, Small Catechism, you're going to have the Book of Concord. You can't deviate from those. See what I'm saying here? You are never, ever going to be able to think for yourself as long as you stay in any man-made sect. You say, so what do I need to do? <sighs> okay, you are going to have to either leave that Bible study or you're going to have to big time put yourself out there and you're going to have to convert them into the New Testament church, which they need to be. You're going to have to start really buckling down and studying the Bible to get to these Bible principles. You're going to have to stop this idea about babies are born in sin. And here's the thing. If you, if you would root out the idea that babies are born in sin, then you would, I'm saying, y'all, people abuse God's grace and that's exactly what they're doing when y'all teach them once saved, always saved. Charles Stanley, big time Baptist preacher, wrote a book where he said, even if you stop believing in Jesus, you're once saved, always saved. This was years ago, Baptist preacher down in Texas. He said, it doesn't matter how many people murder, I murder or steal from or fornicate or rape. 
He said, I'm once saved, always saved. What? Are you kidding? Someone says, that sounds wild, but that's actually the logical conclusion of the Baptist idea of once saved, always saved. See, you're going to have to get into the book. We're going to start doing a lot better. And it's just, I'm saying these things about y'all are confused on which day you need to be gathering to have Bible study. Saturday the Sabbath or first day of the week. See what I'm saying? You're either going to have to leave because they're going to kick you out or you're going to have to change the whole Bible study. And someone says, well, what do you want, Caleb? You want us to start calling ourselves the Church of Christ? Well, heaven forbid that we give any type of credence and glorification to Jesus the Christ, that we say, we are the Church of Christ. No, 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 no. Y'all want to be uh, John the Baptist Church. Y'all want to glorify the cousin of Jesus, but not Jesus himself. See what I'm saying? Yes, that's exactly what you do. You go to the Bible, you're going to call yourself the Church of Christ because that's what they're referring to themselves as in the New Testament. Now, we get really down to New Testament. Let's look at this. The churches of Christ salute you. We get really down to New Testament. We don't have a single sect in the town. We can just say the church. Simplify it, man, because we would just be saying, we all know what that is. It is the church that Jesus died for. It's the church that he established in the first century. We could be, I'm saying, big time simplifying it. Now, that's the, that's the whole purpose of the broadcast. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. And I want you, and God wants you, to be studying your Bible. Let me say this too. Everybody you know, man, wants you to be studying the Bible. And why is that? Because if you were studying the Bible and really taking in the, in the teachings, you'd be a better person to be around. We wouldn't have to worry. Look, we could be leaving everything out on the work desk. Somebody says, man, don't you know if you leave that out on the desk, Ted's going to come by and snatch that up. Well, how do you know Ted's going to do it? Ted, Ted steals from everybody, man. See, I'm saying we would get these principles. I'm not going to steal from people. Ephesians chapter 4 the person who stole let him steal no more, but work with his hands that he might be able to give to those who have need. See what I'm saying? You'd be a better person to be around. I'd be a better person to be around. I'm trying. I'm trying to bring in these principles and be a better person to be around, but it starts with your Bible study. Look at this, thinking for yourself. Now, we used John 7 last week because we said y'all are not accustomed to preachers talking like this. Y'all, man, y'all got some know-nothing, sissy preachers that won't stand for anything. So I get it. You're saying, we, we've never seen anything. Like, what does the Bible say? I know it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you can't be getting some real biblical doctrine where you go, but that's just the way that it is. Look at what they said in John 7. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? But look at what their, their standard was. Have any of the rulers of the, or the Pharisees believed on him? And what does that translate to? You said, I was studying my Bible, and this is what I'm thinking. And somebody says, did you run that by the pastor? Well, if the pastor's not saying that, I don't think I'd bring it up. He is not, listen, y'all, he might be telling you he's got the Holy Ghost. He does not have the Holy Ghost. He's not above you in any sense on this idea that he's ordained. And people say, well, I was called to the ministry. You weren't called to nothing because the New Testament doesn't talk that way. Everybody in the world has been called to receive salvation, but they don't choose to receive it, not all of them. That's the way the Bible says that people are called. And if you want to know the verse, it's 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to see somebody being called. They're not called to be a one-man pastor. Now, how are you doing? How are you feeling with this? I'm fixing to show you five individuals from the Presbyterian denomination who they voiced their disagreement with their creed book, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and they, the people who were in charge said, y'all get out of here. <sighs> that would be you. If you, started ra if you started asking questions like, why do we baptize babies over here? You start asking questions like, look, y'all, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 is in the Bible, but we got women preachers all over this place. What are we doing? You start asking them questions like, can you show me a piano in the New Testament? Can you show me in the New Testament where the New Testament church uh, tithed? They're, gonna make, they're going to be mad at you, and I'm not mad at you. And look, y'all, there's a lot of people in this town who don't agree with me. I don't get mad at them. Nick Cole took a restraining order out on me from the Episcopalian uh, denomination. I'm not mad at him. I don't have any, like, bone to pick with Nick Cole or any of these, any of these man-made sect preachers. I don't have any type of personal problem with them. I just disagree with the doctrines that they're teaching because the stuff they're teaching is not of the Bible. Okay, you're good. I'm good if you're good. 
Are we friends? Remember, we've been talking about you and watching the show for so long. I feel like we're friends. I know, in fact, with some of y'all, I know we're friends. And you and I can't do anything about the people who would talk bad about the both of us. Now, let's look at this. When I asked that man, I said, do you know about uh, Barton Stone? He said, no, I don't. So here's actually the way it happened. I had Barton Stone's uh, papers from the 1800s, like the 1820s. I had his papers in my car. Well, then I have the autobiography of Barton Stone, and I've been reading it, but here's the thing. I didn't want to use this book, even though I could have. I didn't want to use this book because remember what, if I use this, y'all would say, well, Caleb, you used material that was leaning to, to support your position already. You used a biased source. So what I'm doing is I'm switching to this book, and y'all already know this book. Why? Because this is the book that we're going to get to see in a little bit, it talks about in the 1820s just how much damage Alexander Campbell did to the Presbyterian denomination. But I went back in here and I found Richard McNamara, which was in this book too. Now, are you with me? We're looking at Richard McNamara. What was their problem in the Presbyterian church with Mr. McNamara? He had been convicted upon orderly examination of holding Arminian tenants. Now, Y'all have seen me debate with John Carpenter, and you saw Micah Martin attempt to have a debate until he stormed off, and those were on Calvinism. And they would say, Caleb is an Arminian. And no, I'm not. I'm not an Arminian. And, the, and there are reasons. I've done all kinds of shows about the Synod of Dort, Canons of Dort, to where they were talking about the five points. I've done shows about the remonstrance of the five points. I do not buy into Arminianism. They still believed in to a degree of depravity. I don't believe in any depravity that's innate. No babies coming out of the womb with any type of sinful nature, guilt of sin, none of that. That baby is a clean slate. So you can't peg me with Arminianism. But all they meant by that at that time frame was they said, Richard McNamara will not teach, he will not teach born in sin, and he will not teach unconditional election. And what they mean by unconditional election is there's nothing that you could possibly do to be saved. You can't even believe on your own. They said you will forever be destined to hell unless God sends the Holy Spirit to operate directly on you. Has nothing to do with preaching, has nothing to do with Bible study. God just willy-nilly out here electing people. Well, McNamara wouldn't teach that. So what'd they do? they all started paying attention to him. And everybody started, different preachers in the Presbyterian group started writing complaints about McNamara to the Synod of Kentucky. And they're saying, y'all need to keep an eye on this dude. Y'all need to discipline this dude. Well, look at how Barton Stone actually talks about the way that it went. They said that McNamara was teaching Arminianism, but look what Barton Stone says. Of the present revival, preachers in general who were truly engaged in it omitted the doctrines of election and reprobation as explained in the Confession of the Faith. What is he talking about? Westminster, the creed for the Presbyterians. And they proclaimed a free salvation to all men through the blood of the Lamb. So what he says was they just weren't teaching it. They omitted it. They just weren't touching it. Now here's my thing. I asked a Baptist preacher in Collinsville, and I said, would you let a Methodist come over and you uh, swap pulpits with you? You, you go to the, his Methodist church on a Sunday, and that Methodist comes to your Baptist church on a Sunday. Would you do it? He said, yeah, I'd do it. I said, could he teach Methodist doctrine in your pulpit? He said, well, no, he couldn't teach Methodist doctrine in my pulpit. Look what he says they were doing. They just weren't teaching Calvinism. And look what they said. That's not good enough. Would you let a Methodist preacher come in and preach in your pulpit if he agreed that he would not talk about sprinkling babies? Some of y'all would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't let him in the pulpit unless... We were going to get to have some back and forth. If he wanted to take 15 minutes and then I get 15 minutes, hey, he can have the floor. But we're not just going to let him do that. These people said, if you're not willing to teach it, we're not going to have you at all. See what I'm saying? Now let's think about this today. I'm pushing right now, what I'm doing is I'm pushing for real unity as far as religion in this community. And let's talk about this. A lot of y'all say to me, Caleb, you need to learn to agree to disagree. Okay, I'm hearing y'all. I'm, I'm taking some notes. Let me ask you this question. Can I come to your Baptist church and preach on Mark 16, 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Can I teach that? 
Now keep in mind, I won't say a word against salvation by belief only. I won't say a word about the sinner's prayer. All I, all I will do is teach Mark 16, 16 that Jesus said a person who wants to be saved, this is how they're going to be saved and I don't have to knock anything. Would you let me do it? No, you would not. So don't give me this business about let's all agree to disagree. You don't believe in agree to disagree and neither did the Presbyterians in the 1800s. Nobody believes in agree to disagree. You're in the sect that you're in because you think it's better than any other sect. You don't agree to disagree with anybody. The problem is y'all don't know any Bible and you can't talk to anybody. And then I do know what the Bible says and you get mad at me for it. That's, that's exactly where we are. Now you may not like that. Let's talk about this too. Let's go to Acts 8. I know that you understand this. You are smart. You got a good brain and I know you get this. Look at Acts 8 verse number 38. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. What if I came to your Presbyterian church, or I came to your Methodist church, or your Lutheran church, or your Catholic church, or your Anglican church? Can't get into the Anglican church because Nick Cole doesn't want me over there. But what if I came in and I didn't say a word against sprinkling? I never mentioned sprinkling babies, but I said if you're going to do it the Bible way, then you're going to be immersed. If you want to follow God the way that he really authorized... You're going to be buried in the water. Would you let me come in and preach? No, you wouldn't. See, it has nothing to do with agree to disagree. I, I'm telling you, I won't say anything about sprinkling babies, but you let me teach you the exact prescription from the New Testament. Would you like it? You'd hate it. Because everybody in the pew would know exactly what I was doing, and that's exactly what Richard McNamara was doing. He was omitting the Calvinist doctrines, and he was teaching that people were free to follow Jesus. They were free to reject Jesus. And the synod of the Presbyterians found out, and they said, nope, not going to cut it. Look what they said. A agree to disagree? Presbyterian history? Is that the Presbyterian tradition? No, it's not. If you're agreeing to disagree right now and you're a Presbyterian 2020, you're not keeping tradition. When they found out what Richard McNamara was teaching, they said, it is dangerous and unconstitutional characters of his tenets. The synod proceeded to suspend the five men from the office of the ministry and then they declared that their pulpits would become vacant. Hmm. Agree to disagree. Boy, they didn't know about it in the 1800s, did they? Well, what, what's really happening? These people actually had some conviction in the 1800s. Were they wrong? They were wrong. Calvinism is not the biblical doctrine. But they at least were going to stand for what they believed. Y'all today are just wishy-washy. And I'm saying, y'all, when I say mamby-pamby, no spine, no conviction, all that is based on the one principle of you don't study your Bible. That's all that this is. I know, I'm saying some of y'all, man, you are big and bad and you will give your neighbor what for. You have probably knocked out I don't know how many people in your life, but you don't know the Bible and you can't even hang in a Bible discussion. And that's your problem. We're not talking about people don't have courage. We're saying you don't have the information to motivate you to take some action, and that's why I'm here tonight. I'm here to give you the information from your own history books, plus the Bible, which is the most important, and I'm saying, now do something with it. Stop, y'all, stop baptizing, and I'm saying it's not even, bapt not even baptism. Stop sprinkling these babies and confusing them. They grow up, number one, they grow up and they say, I didn't choose to be sprinkled. How could God say that that was me following him when that's something my parents did? There's plenty of stuff that my parents have chosen for me that I didn't like. And then you start looking at the Bible and you're saying, I wasn't baptized anyway. These kids are confused. And then the parents step back and say, we just don't know why, you know, Timmy is not coming to church. It doesn't make a lick of sense to Timmy. You've never explained it. You may have handed him like a discipline, but he recognizes that's not the Bible. See, what I'm here to do tonight is give you the information to motivate you to actually do something. Give you the scripture so you can do something. Let me tell you this story. I was picking up some time ago. I'd go, I met these people door knocking. And just like I said last time, when I find kids, I say, y'all want to go to Bible class? Kids always want to go to Bible class. And since I'm taking the two brothers, two little boys, bringing the brothers to Bible class, their mama's coming to Bible class. So we go to pick them up. And she's riding with me in the car. The boys are there. My wife goes with me. We're all in the car. And she says, does the Bible say 
uh, that women shouldn't preach, and I want everybody to have the verse. Look at this. Now, she had already, this was her second time coming to visit with us. And I said, yes, ma'am. That's 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. And she said, that's what I told my mama. And she said, my mama argued with me, but I told her mama it's in the Bible, but she couldn't remember where it was. And so she wrote it down in the car. She said, now that I know where it is, I'm going to tell my mom where it is. She said, you can't argue with the Bible. See what I'm saying? We met them door knocking. We asked the kids, y'all want to come to Bible class? Now we got everybody in the car. And what she already doing, now I'm going to make a point here. What was she already doing, y'all? This was a woman who, after coming to one Bible class and hearing a piece of Scripture, was already telling everybody she knew. And I'm saying, some of you men are low down, good for nothing, won't tell anybody anything. I don't understand you. Now, I'm talking to the men here, right? Let's look at some more Bibles. Somebody say, Caleb, you can't talk to people like this. Are you kidding me? We're in the world, man. We are full-grown adults. We are in the world People are either going to go to heaven or they are going to go to an eternal hell. And you're going to talk to me about I can't talk to somebody. He says, quit you like men, be strong, and you men don't have anything to you. I don't understand. I'm not trying to be mean. I would like to enlist you. If you're going to get some courage about yourself, I'd like to enlist you into this fight for unity. What am I trying to do? Well, we know what you're trying to do, Caleb. You're trying to get everybody down into your church so you can get more money. Number one, I don't have a church. And number two, I already told you we're not pressing tithing like y'all do. I'm not driving a Bentley like Lawrence Campbell from Bible Way Cathedral down in Danville. Now, what can I say? I'm saying I have had so many men in home Bible studies admit to me. They say, Caleb, I know what you guys are teaching is the truth. They say it's right out of the Bible. And then they turn around and say, but my wife will not go for it. Okay, you're not obeying the gospel. Let's look at this. <sighs> Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You're not obeying the gospel, and you're not a Christian. You're not even the head of your house. Someone says, well, I can't make my wife do anything. Okay, well, your m wife is making you do something. You say, I can't make my wife do anything. She's her own woman. You ain't your own man if you can't obey the gospel because you say, my wife won't like it. Yes, we're saying this to you. You are not your own man, and you're not the head of the house. Now, this is just a little excursion. Let's get back to it. Look at what ended up happening. Now, they're going. To, here's how you do it. Here's how you basically do this, y'all. You get both sides. Here's the Presbyterian story. History of the Presbyterian Church by Robert Davidson. Here's the autobiography of Barton Stone. Now, these five men started saying, we're not teaching Calvinism. We're not going to do it. And so they're not getting a fair shake. They're getting all kinds of back and forth, getting the run around. So these five men say, look, we're separating from y'all. We're not trying to start a new sect. We're not trying to start a new party. But they said, we're not going to be underneath y'all's presbytery because we're not getting fair representation. So what happens when somebody tries to quit on the job and the boss doesn't like them? They say, okay, look, guys, this, this isn't for me. I'm quitting. And the boss says, well, you can't quit. You're fired. That's what the Presbyterians did. They said, you can't leave us. We're kicking you out. But look what happened. The schismatics, that's the five men who w refused to teach Calvinism. The schismatics entered into a, on a course of sleepless activity. The five sus suspended ministers, already highly popular, exerted themselves to the utmost to attract the multitude and appealing to their sympathy as persecuted persons endeavored to convert the censures of the church into a much additional capital in their own favor. A torrent of mad enthusiasm swept over the entire territory of the synod threatening an extensive subversion of truth and order. Several tracts and pamphlets were published, breathing a spirit of confident exultation, indulging in the boldest language of anticipated triumph. Such progress was made that before the end of the year 1804, there were regular societies, and we're going to keep going, there were regular societies organized, and what he's going to say is, they were, by the time of 1804, regular societies who were democratic in their structure, referring to themselves as Christians only. 1804 is five years before Alexander Campbell gets to America. And why is all this getting started? Because five men stood up and said, we are not teaching born in sin anymore. We're not teaching unconditional election anymore. And when they started having these problems, they said, well, we already don't agree with this stuff. We also don't agree with calling ourselves Presbyterians. 
and they started calling themselves Christians. Now let's keep looking at this. What did he say? Sleepless activity. Here's the thing. Look, y'all, you can't be this lazy Christian, man. Sleepless activity. Y'all are Christians on Sunday only. You don't have any activity outside of Sunday. You're not talking to anybody. You're not making any effort. And you're fine with that because you say, well, Caleb, what do you want us to do outside of Sunday? That's what we pay the preacher to do. No, there is nowhere in the New Testament where you get that idea. In Acts 8, everybody went everywhere teaching the gospel. Acts 8 does not say, and the preachers went out teaching the gospel and the Christians stayed home. You know better than this. Look at this now. He says, sleepless activity, a mad enthusiasm. Now, this is exactly what we saw two weeks ago when we looked at James O'Kelly. 1,000 souls departed from the heirs of Methodist Episco Episcopacy in a few days with James O'Kelly. What did they do? They're leaving the Methodist church behind. Look at this other quote. He and at least four of his followers picked up their saddlebags and walked out. Within a few months, he had formed his own Republican Methodist church, and after that, they're going to stop calling it the Republican Methodist church. They're just going to say the Christian church or something of that nature, but they're calling themselves Christians. Within a year, he had lured 10,000 Methodists into the idea of no book but the Bible, calling ourselves Christians only. Now that was in the 1790s. Now let's jump ahead a little bit, and this is how y'all know the book. This is how y'all have been introduced to history of the Presbyterian Church by Robert Davidson, is because years later in the 1820s, after James O'Kelly, after Richard McNamara and Barton Stone, you've got Alexander Campbell, and look what they said the history of the Presbyterian said. He gradually made a number of converts to his no creed views. That sounds very, very similar, doesn't it? The Bible only with James O'Kelly, Bible only with Rice Haggard, Bible only with Barton Stone, Bible only with Richard McNamara, and all this has been going on. Alexander Campbell's not even in America yet. Well, now he's here in America, and he's saying Bible only, and look what happens. Their progress has been onward ever since, swelling in less than 20 years to the number of 150,000 members in less than 20 years. Alexander Campbell convinced 150,000 people to leave Presbyterianism. My question to you tonight is, do you have a Bible? When you read your New Testament, do you see anybody calling themselves the Presbyterian Church? No, you don't. Do you call, see the collection of people following Jesus as a whole referring to themselves as Presbyterians? No, you don't. Or do you find anybody in the New Testament sprinkling their babies? No, you don't. Why are you in that group? Why? And I'm saying, I'm showing you out of your history book, if you're a Presbyterian, I'm showing out of your history book where 150,000 people left in less than 20 years. And, and let me talk now. Pause. Brethren, how y'all think we're going to get results in today's world? You are not going to get results by paying someone else to do the job. And what are results? I am not talking about get, convincing someone to go underneath the water. I'm con talking about converting their mind. Look at James 5, 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. How does that word convert work? He has left the truth and you bring him back to it. And I'm talking about people have never been connected to the truth, but we bring them into it and we convert them. How are you going to do it? Look at what they said. The Presbyterians in the 1800s said, Mr. Alexander Campbell's forte is controversy. How did he convince 150,000 people to come out of the Presbyterian Church and seek out the religion of the New Testament? Somebody says, well, Alexander Campbell was one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Never had an enemy. Never would even kick a dog. Very, very nice man. What? Now, nobody said that you can't be a nice man and take the people to task. He was taking their own literature. Look at this. His paper in seven volumes was called The Christian Baptist. Now, y'all would be doing yourself a big favor if you would stop reading Francis Chan and you'd stop reading N.T. Wright and you start reading some of these papers from history that actually people got something done other than an Episcopalian bishop who ain't doing nothing. That's N.T. Wright. I don't know why y'all study and just ooh and awe over these guys. R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was a big time false teaching Calvinist. I don't know why y'all even talk about him. Get on what these men were doing because they were making converts and in 20 years 150,000 people. This is history, y'all, and you just can't, the, the evidence is right here. You might be saying, well, that's Alexander Campbell. 
Do you think that Paul wasn't controversial? Do you think that Peter wasn't controversial? Do you think that James in Acts chapter 12 was beheaded because he was not controversial? Do you think John was, bad, uh, was beheaded by Herod because he was not controversial? You've got to get this out of your mind that you're not going to be controversial and win souls. It's just not going to work that way. Look at this. We're not done. He says they had a mad just wave going through the, he said, the country of the Sinai, Kentucky. They now stood unequivocally committed to print upon the subject of doctrine as well as of order, denying the positions of the confession of faith in regard to the divine decrees, the atonement, and the special influences of the Spirit in the production of faith. They maintained that all creeds and confessions ought to be rejected and that the Bible alone, without note or comment, should be the bond of Christian fellowship. Now, is that so bad? We just want the Bible. Now, you're somebody who sits in the pew of a man-made sect, and you say, well, we just use the Bible. No, you don't. Y'all got creed books. You got church covenants and church contracts. You do not just have the Bible only, and that's what these people wanted. They kicked back at Calvinism and said, just give us the Bible. Now, look at this. Y'all. It's in your history book. I'm not falsifying. I'm not monkeying with anything. It's in your text. Y'all in 2020, you're calling people a Campbellite. Well, in this time frame, Alexander Campbell wasn't in America, so you can't call these people Campbellites. So what did they do? They picked out another man. They picked out, well, y'all just following somebody. If you're not a Campbellite, you're a Haggardite. Isn't that just dumb? How about I'm just following the Bible, man? I'm saying the Bible only plus no creed books. Look at this. Filled with the pleasing dream, he's talking about Barton Stone, filled with the pleasing dream of an approaching universal kingdom which was to embrace the whole earth, they proposed to establish a grand communion which should agree to unite upon the simplest fundamental principles, principles like what they said, according to a plan drawn up by Rice Haggard. They weren't following Rice Haggard. Now, Rice Haggard may have said, give me the Bible by itself, but these people came up with the idea, give us the Bible by itself. And they just so happened to be in a world where Rice Haggard was also. And then Alexander Campbell comes on the scene. He doesn't know any of these people because he's been over in Scotland. And when he comes in, he starts seeing problems with Presbyterian doctrine. He says, just give me the Bible, man. <laughs> you know that Rice Haggard stuff? What? Who is that? Just following the Bible. Look at this. They went with this plan drawn up by Rice Haggard, such as worshiping one God, acknowledging Jesus Christ as a Savior, taking the Bible for the sole confession of faith, Organizing on the New Testament model. That's, man, that's what I'm about. Organizing on a New Testament model. Y'all got so much going on and you hate it. You got a board. Like I said, I'm talking to Methodists in town. They say, well, the board did this for us. The board sent in the new preacher and we didn't even have a say on it. New Testament model. To this union of all disciples of Christ, they gave the name the Christian Church. Now, if you go to Barton Stone's paper, Barton Stone at the beginning of every of his paper says... Barton Stone, an elder of the Church of Christ. So, again, I'm reading out of Presbyterian histories. I can't help that they're still calling people reverend and things like that when these people flat out in this book rejected the title of rev reverend. What? I can't help that y'all didn't get your story straight. Would recognize no sectarian appellation, Christians only. They had not yet, and now here's a point too, they had not as yet reached the point of intolerance which was afterwards incorporated in their system, the denial of infant baptism and of any mode of baptism but immersion. Now, someone would say, well, they would call themselves the Christian church. Well, I've already told you in his paper, he says he's a member of the Church of Christ. But can you not see here? They said they haven't fully made their change yet. He said at this point, they had not yet begun to reject infant baptism, but soon they would, and they would be exclusive to the idea of immersion only. What do you think about this? You're sitting at home and you're saying, I can't, I can't even tell you how many people I have told to say the sinner's prayer and it's not in the New Testament. Okay, you're upset about that. And I understand. I hate it for you too. You've told a lot of people to say the sinner's prayer and whoever you told that to, they're not saved. But it makes no sense for you to say, but I'm going to stay exactly where I am. I'm going to stay in the, in the man-made sect exactly where they taught me to say the sinner's prayer and I'm going to keep telling people about the sinner's prayer. Why would you do that? Why would you not do what these five men did and just renounce, give up the sectarian history and begin searching out New Testament religion? I don't understand it. Look, 
they said they're just with Rice Haggard. This is just a little blurb. Y'all remember last week? Rice Haggard. They called him Reverend. They had renounced the idea of a man being called Reverend. Stood up in the meeting with a copy of the New Testament in his hand and said, Brethren, this is a sufficient rule of faith and practice, and, if, and by it we are told that the disciples were called Christians, and I move that we henceforth, uh, henceforth and forever the followers of Christ be known as Christians simply. And you're out here calling yourself a Presbyterian. You're out here calling yourself a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Lutheran or a Methodist. I'm driving for unity here. Let's talk about this. We've got just a few minutes left. You don't have it. Remember what I said earlier? You number, number one and two, what this show is purpose for. We would love for you to study your Bible more. And we would love for you to think on your own. But you will never be able to do that because you are constantly going to have to double check with what the pastor says. And the pastor is going to have to leave you if you're in the pre uh, Presbyterian church. You're going to run over and say, Pastor, what do you think about this? And he's going to say, uh, give me a couple of days. He's going to run over to the presbytery and he's going to say, what do y'all think about this? And they're going to say, give us a couple of days. And they're going to consult with the entire synod and then they're going to say, mm, we can't do that. Why not? Well, it goes against the Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, what about the Bible? No, 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 it goes against the Confession of Faith. See, that's where you are. And when I talk about freedom of religion in Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, where, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You are very, very much entangled with your sectarian doctrines. Now, here's the thing. Y'all have seen a lot of broadcasts where people call in and they want to talk to me about John 3.16. Now, I love John 3.16. John 3.16 is a fantastic passage. I believe John 3.16. I don't think that it means what you guys think it means in the Baptist denomination, that all you got to do is believe only. And people call in and they get mad. And you're watching them, and some people at home, y'all, we've had people who watch this broadcast who actually tell us, they say, before I can watch your broadcast, I've got to take my heart medicine because my blood pressure gets going, and I get so worked up. Now, I'll tell you why some people get worked up is because they are very, very much entangled in sectarian viewpoints. Now, I'm operating simply on the Bible, and I don't have any difficulty talking to any of y'all. A Pentecostal could call in as much as a Lutheran or a Catholic, and I'm going to be able to have an intelligent conversation with you because I'm strictly going by the Bible. But see, you're worried about what your preacher says on Sunday and what y'all's convention says or what your board members say, and you can't just have a conversation with me. And then a lot of people will call in, and they'll be saying, they'll be saying something, and you'll hear a voice from the back say, tell them this, tell them, say this to them. They're getting help, and it's not helping them. Why? Because that fellow in the back is just as entangled as they are. I'm saying take your Bible, throw off the creed books, throw off, and let's say it this way. You maybe have never seen an Edward T. Hiscox standard manual in your life. That doesn't mean that your pastor doesn't have one. It doesn't mean that y'all aren't following it to some degree. But let me say this. What would you think about me saying to you if you're reading out of a John R. Rice reference Bible or you're reading out of a Jerry Falwell reference Bible or you're reading out of a Schofield reference Bible? What would you think if I said, why don't you put that aside for about seven months? Let me, let me talk with you for about seven, and it wouldn't take that long, but I'm saying let's be generous here. Seven months where you're not constantly coached by some man's footnotes in your Bible. You'd be making so much more headway. If you could read Acts 22:16 without getting the junk from the Jerry Falwell Liberty Annotated Reference Bible, man, you would be on your way because it's so simple. And that's why I am able to enjoy Bible study the way that I do is because I am free. I don't have to consult. And here's the beautiful thing about Bible study. Why, Caleb, you say you don't have any care about Bible study and you're not worried about agreeing or disagreeing with anybody else. Well, here's the thing. I can read my Bible... And if I find these other folk who I've not met before and they're reading their Bible and they say, man, he's on it just like we are. And I'm saying they're on it just like I am. Why? Because it's what the Bible says and it is that simple. I don't have to worry. And it's like y'all are shocked when people from other states actually adapt themselves. To, you say, well, y'all just following what does the Bible say? They're reading their Bibles and they're saying this makes sense. Why? Why? because they're not having to consult with creed books anymore. 
He says, Stand in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, some of y'all, too, you can't have Bible discussions with anybody like I can because you, in fact, are miserable with the things that you believe. Man, I am telling you, any Calvinist, I'm not being ugly, but I'm saying it drives you, it's got to drive you crazy. How does a Calvinist know that he's saved? Well, we, we are saved by the grace of God only, and we're not saved by our works. Okay, but how do you manifest your salvation to yourself and anybody else? By our good works. You couldn't have a clue whether or not you were really saved by God unless you did good things. Now, you might be saying that you don't count it on the front end, but y'all sure get it on the back end. You got to work your way to heaven to keep yourself confident. That's not what I'm doing, man. I do not even want to begin to have my works discussed. Now, listen here. Have I been obedient to the gospel? Yes. But I don't want to talk about my good deeds before God for the hope that we can, if we say, let's not even talk about my good deeds and maybe we won't talk about the bad things that I've done. See what I'm saying? These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. How do I know that I have eternal life? I consult with the New Testament. It's not based on the good things that I do, but if you're a Calvinist, that's exactly what you're doing. He says this is the confidence that we have in Him. I am very confident. Someone has asked me multiple times, Caleb, if you died right now, where are you going? I'm going to heaven. You don't think that you might possibly go? No, I am not going to heaven. How can you just say that? I am covered in the blood. I'm in the body of Christ. Now you might be saying, you said I a lot. Whose blood am I covered in? Jesus. Whose church am I in? Jesus. <laughs> Every bit of my confidence, man, is on Jesus. Now, y'all can't do that and it burns you up. But I'm saying I don't want to fight with you. I'm not just out here to burn you up. I'm in here to get you thinking. I'm in here to get you in your book. I'm in here to get you to start asking your pastor questions. And I can already tell you that's going to be uncomfortable. You might as well get ready for him to bark at you or something. Who told you to ask that question? What you causing trouble for? I've had that said to me so many times. What you want to cause trouble for? I'm just trying to ask a question, man. I just thought this was a friendly atmosphere. See what I'm saying? Freedom in Christ. Now, you see how we have it underlined? We have something highlighted. He hath made me free. I, listen, I understand. I already said John 7. You've never seen preaching like this before. I am the way that I am because the truth, the gospel, is in fact so good, I don't have time to mess around with the junk y'all are spouting. What I'm trying to do is give the truth, and I, look, in this broadcast, I've only got an hour to do it. And so I got to go hard to get breakthrough, y'all. I got to break through a whole lifetime of your incorrect thinking. You say, Caleb, how can you say incorrect thinking? Because the Bible said that. John 12, 48, you're not teaching the Bible, it's incorrect. Now, I want you to be free, and I want you to have confidence, but the only way you're going to get it is if you're in Christ. Look at Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Faith, it is important. Faith is the element that's taking me to heaven by grace through faith. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But here's the thing. You can't claim New Testament faith if you're refusing to be baptized into Christ. Okay, caller, this is what does the Bible say? They hung up. I don't know why you would wait till I got a minute to have a conversation because I got to go. I want you to be free. Freedom is found, the Bible says, in Christ. How do you get into Christ? The Bible says you are baptized into Christ. You will never find a New Testament passage that says you believe into Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. And this is how you get into Christ. Now, closing out, my phone number is 276-806-3641. My dad is 276, his name is Johnny, 276-806-2150. My email is calebgrobinson at gmail.com. Now, you watch this show tonight, and if you're saying that made just a little bit of sense, start talking to me. I'm not trying to get in your money. I'm just trying to help you go to heaven with those of us who are in the body of Christ. We love you. Y'all keep asking, what does the Bible say?